with that i'll uh, uh, give it to gaurav thank you gaurav for taking this uh, session and please take it out thanks for uh, in the premise but essentially i think uh, what we want to cover in these five days is to start with uh, design thinking uh, probably all of you already know what it is and um, what does it entail uh, but we also want to cover some aspects of human centered design as well there is a big debate that people distinguish between design thinking and human centered design where a few people feel and there are these notions um, a few people think that design thinking looks at the bigger picture it focuses on innovation and creating products or services that solve problems uh, while human centered design it, uh, looks at the details right uh, which essentially means that it's a way of improving the usability or the user experience of a particular product or a service or a module that we have designed uh, but if you think about it uh, what we are going to cover in these five days is essentially looking at the bigger picture looking at how do we innovate how do we collaborate what are the mindsets and um, and things that we need to um, inherit from design thinking also look at how do we use some of the tools and principles and um, templates if you may want to call it for usability and uh, user experience improvements and essentially try and cover both aspects of human centered design as well as design thinking right um so what we would want to do uh, to start with is just look at some of the um i would say some of the ideas behind uh design thinking how it evolved and what it means and what are the different phases what 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 are the different mindsets etc and then maybe uh from day 3 onwards we start looking at the tools and uh, the templates and the processes that we use and slowly gets toward usability as well as uh, other aspects that we can use for testing etc right uh, so I plan to do uh, both of these, cover in these five days. And there, there would be opportunities where uh, we can discuss, debate, brainstorm, etc. But uh, it is up to you guys when you guys want to unmute yourself, ask questions, stop me in between, right? Up to you guys. Um, it would be beneficial if we uh, talk through this. Um, so that it's not really uh, one way communication right uh, so feel free to unmute yourself or uh, keep your questions write it down and once we are done with the session every day we can look at probably the last 15 20 minutes to go through some of those questions right and any ideas that you guys have uh, because you've been um, doing this in and out for quite some time now right how do we uh, modify some of those aspects in our future sessions, uh, right? So uh, anything that you feel uh, that we can improve upon tomorrow, any areas that you want to cover, any tools, any specific um, things that I touched upon, uh, that I touch upon today, which needs further explanation, we can also do that uh, towards the end, and then I can plan my tomorrow session accordingly. All right um okay um and uh maybe it's one of you uh, 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 sorry one question so we will learn this one uh and then it's the end of the day possibly end of the uh not today it's end of the last fifth day possibly you can give, just give the short your opinion about how this ai is impacting our ui ux whether it's impacting or not impacting so right now it is like a lot of buzz is going on the market. So I would also would like to know your opinion. Thanks. Okay, sure. And maybe um, Hemant, you can uh, also figure out if you could do this maybe 30 minutes earlier, if possible, if everyone um, could be available. If not, then we can uh, go with the existing schedule as well. Sure. All right, so let me share my screen. Let's get started with this. Um, 
Turn one. All right. Let me know what are you seeing on your screen now. Uh, we see the presentation. All right. yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. All right. So all of us understand that today innovation is everyone's business. Um, and at all levels, we are always challenged to innovate, uh, whether we are a designer, whether we are a, we are acting as a product owner, or we are trying to gather requirements and try to play a role of a business analyst, or uh, trying to design a product, or a service, or a policy anything that we do, there is always a continuous demand that everyone needs to innovate from whatever exists uh, today. Right. Uh, so whether you're a manager or an architect or a developer, designer, entrepreneur, somebody who's starting up a business, uh, somebody who's teaching in a, in, a, in a higher education market, let's say, uh, somebody who gives lectures or a teacher who's teaching in elementary school uh, in K-12, everyone is expected to go lean to do better with less, right? Uh, which essentially means that you don't put uh, too much on the receiver, but essentially how do we go as little as possible and convey the idea, convey the concept easily so that the person who is at the receiving end with as little as possible cognitive load understands what the idea uh, is or what the concept is, right? Uh, and that is the way we all need design thinking to think about those aspects. At every level, uh, in every kind of organization, design thinking provides the tools you need to become um, an innovative thinker and uncover creative opportunities that are there. Uh, you're just not seeing some of them. Um, so I, I welcome all of you guys, uh, for this five day journey. We're excited that all of you are here. Um, uh, we would want to have a uh, fun and, and fast experience learning about some of these concepts and a creative systematic approach, uh, to solving some of the challenging problems that we see there in day out. Okay. Uh, in this five days, we would want to provide an overview of design thinking, work with a model containing four key questions to help you understand design thinking and human centered design um, with a, a problem solving approach as well as to improve experience and the usability of existing products. Uh, you'll hear some of the stories uh, about design thinking in action, uh, learn more about uh, the tools, consider your own mindsets and see where uh, are these biases uh, and how do we overcome those and think about quick and simple ways to test and innovate solutions using some of the guidelines and the principles that are set by design thinking right so what are the uh, so some of the things that we would want to cover in these three sessions or these five sessions rather are preparing uh, a mind for innovation um preparing ourselves to generate more and more ideas and try and be experimental as much as possible, right? Uh, some of you know me, there are a lot of new people uh, in, in the group. Uh, my name is Gaurav. Uh, I am AVP for CMS and UX. Uh, I've handled and built this uh, team um, for almost 11 years uh, at Learning Mate. Last year, I transitioned into a new role and uh, I've worked with most of you guys, uh, but uh, just a small little background. Uh, with my role in design and experience, user experience design, essentially and product design, I have run 30 plus design sprints, um, which is uh, in the last one and a half, two years, um, run some 15 odd uh, lightning design champs. Uh, 100 plus interviews uh, with just one customer and a lot of usability testing um, uh, for existing product as well as the ones that we have been designing uh, for uh, for the various products that we do. All right, so 
I'm sure um, you must be frustrated uh, that there is always a, there's always a, a, an opportunity to design better, right? Um, and design thinking will show you how to structure your natural creativity to come up with solutions uh, to all kinds of problems and have the fun in the process. And please focus on fun because that is what uh, we would want to do. Some of the work that we do becomes very, very serious because of various reasons, because of timelines, the people that we work with, um, and all sorts of reasons, right? But essentially design has to be fun if uh, if we really want to innovate, if you really want to create something which is useful and meaningful, um, we have to bring in the fun part. And that's what uh, we'd want to do, right? Uh, what will you get in these five days? Uh, you'll have an awareness of design thinking uh, and how it can be applied in the wide range of contexts uh, from personal as well as global. Now, I stress upon personal because it really helps us uh, think about uh, problems, think about how do we uncover the real problems and come out of a situation, but also try and apply it in every other thing that we do, right? Uh, we would also be investigating and uh, it would help you think creatively about design problems and opportunities. Uh, we would want to initiate an attitude of playfulness, which is what I just talked about as fun part, uh, to aid design thinking, uh, develop visual literacy, uh, and um, articulating your ideas and explaining design decisions uh, better. And of course, use computing tools, online environments, etc., that help you to apply design thinking principles. Now, before we get into this uh, whole thing, what are we exactly talking about? So we're talking about design thinking. Now break these two words um, apart and let's understand what design is. All of you have been designers, you've been designing, but let's spend a few minutes to understand what design is and what exactly is thinking and how it comes together. So it it is always uh, it always feels a little bit um, um, I would say um, difficult uh, for me trying to describe what I do for a living. Uh, calling myself a designer frequently results in misunderstanding that my job is to make software looks products look pretty. Uh, on the other hand, venturing into calling myself as a design leader or a strategist frequently garners look of confusion. Uh, especially those outside of the technology and the design industries um, uh, or education uh, in certain cases. Um, even when speaking with others within the industry, a truly aligned understanding of design role is rare because today design is not just about design, it is also about a lot of things that happen around it. And that's what I try and do. Um, so let's understand what design is all about, right? What are we exactly talking about? So every company, every organization, every team has their own understanding of what design is and what the role of a designer should be, right? That's where the big confusion comes in. Within the user experience field, there are so many specializations, uh, right? Uh, I mean, we've been talking about uh, concepts like, are you a purist or are you a generalist? But if you are, really getting into purist uh, designers, then interaction design and visual designing and information architecture and motion design, prototyping, all of these are um, things that people confuse with. And these roles have overlapped with each other. Our domains um, uh, in various domains, such as marketing, architecture, industrial design, and even sound design. Uh, to add to the confusion, no matter what the mix of roles, on your team, UX is, as a discipline um, itself can be at varying levels of maturity within organization. So um, in my experience, every organization, when you look at their design process and the way they work and the way they uh, exchange uh, communication between different steps, and uh, the success criteria or the exit criteria from one step to another step, they're different. 
some teams might be playing more of service role and fighting for a seat in the strategy table. On the other hand, some companies might have very dedicated teams with a with somebody uh, with a fancy designation like a chief design officer, uh, where um, there is a deeply embodied design team that contributes uh, to the highest level of business and product strategy. The understanding of what design is can really vary across companies, organizations, and teams. So if you feel confused when you explain what you do for a living, it's OK. Design is no longer just seen as a craft for designing interfaces or elements or even product experiences. There is a broader understanding in the industry that design can influence the experience of a user and uh, a user has all of the company uh, and, and of course the company's touch points as well. So essentially, when somebody is interacting with a product that we have built, the, the consumer or the user is essentially looking at learning it or the design team or the brand and trying to experience that brand. It's not just about the screens that we've designed, but it is also about what are we projecting as an organization? Ultimately, all these touch points and product experiences culminate into overarching perception of the company's brand. Uh, the design impacts all of this. It is not just about the product, the, the failure of the product or the success of the product, but it is also about the perception that users would have with the, with the company that has built the product as well. So the focus has shifted and clearly uh, we've seen that change in the last maybe I think 10 odd years. Uh, we've gone from idea that designers simply create usable components and product designs to understanding that their work impacts the perception of the entire brand and the customer experience. Essentially, design is verb as well as noun, if you think about it. Right. So design isn't just about making uh things look appealing or just about usability or even just delight it's about taking products from being usable to delightful and then beyond that which is meaningful and uh, i would in the next few slides we would we would really stress upon meaningful it is a it is a way for us to deliver deep meaning to our customers through the experiences we craft we must strive to elevate the value we deliver to our customers from basic to the functional one and then to the one that goes much beyond. Design needs uh, to not only deliver pleasure and delight, but must deliver deep meaning that we know the people are seeking. And sometimes we create uh, those needs by designing a product that would automatically build that need into the market rather than catering to an existing need in the market. Okay. So everything we, that we design is an, uh, uh, needs to embody the core meaning of the users uh, uh, and what they're seeking. Delivering meaning cannot be an afterthought and desire to do so needs to be deeply embedded in every decision that we take from a design perspective, the culture uh, of the teams, the culture of the company, uh, the mission um, of, a, of a product or mission of a module that we're designing, um, and of course, the strategy and the core value of its employees as well to a certain extent. Meaning needs to be part of the core intent of an organization, of a team, of a design, in everything that we we're talking about here. So designing for meaning is not only beneficial for the end users, but also a key for business success. And that's where you'd see that slowly we're bringing in the business aspects as well into the into what we're calling as design here, right? Uh, so delivering experiences that get the core of what customers really value means that they are willing to identify more deeply with the brand with the organization and the form 
and then form a stronger bond with with the with the company or the product somewhere brand loyalty and advocacy will be higher and the customers will have deep engagement with the products if we are thinking about meaning or creating something that uh, is meaningful thus we will turn um, uh, lead higher uh, use of retention and rather than brief transactional interactions that people have with the product or the brand the interactions will be deeper and longer so meaning meaning um, itself is the guiding and the driving force within each of us um, it's what helps us value ourselves and the products that and the companies that we interact with delivering meaning through the experience creates a deep bond with the users without the meaning we are probably missing the heart of the users uh, heart of what the users are looking for um, no matter what the industry is uh, whether we are working for education whether we are working for higher education or k12 or corporate whether we create products or services whether we have an enterprise or a consumer consumer focus uh, whether it is b2b or b2c or no matter what our role is uh, we have an opportunity to drive the successful business result in a way that also impacts people's lives now almost everything that you see around you is designed uh, that is it exists as a result of human thought about what is needed as you sit in your desks and i'm sitting in in my office at home um, i see a, a mobile phone a cup uh, a light uh, um, uh, uh, maybe a building when i look at the uh, look at the window a computer in front of me um, the chair sure. table everything right these are less obvious things However, there are uh, these are very obvious things, right? I can see it, and I and I understand that there is a thought process and a way uh, that has gone into designing some of these, right? But these are there are less obvious things as well, right? So the software that we're using right now to connect with each other, um, or um, I use a software to write my notes when I'm in a meeting, uh, the circuit board or the motherboard in this laptop um the chips right the circuit board uh all of this right are things which have been designed but we don't really tag them as a design uh output right we probably tag it in, into engineering or things that we don't even notice that it has been designed somewhere right um the notice board uh, that we have uh, in, in our offices where we've pinned images and notices, the documents, the lists uh, of reminders, and of course, those images, documents, the list of reminders themselves have also been designed. And if you look out outside uh, and try and look at uh, the view from the window, uh, you would see natural things like trees and uh, you might think that definitely it's not designed right somebody i mean god created it so <laughs> it might not be designed but essentially uh, from whatever we understand uh, we would probably feel that the way they have been placed or positioned to build the whole um, um, garden or or the sidewalk or even the even the even the placement of those have been according to an overall plan and that is what design is right things and now i mean if you if you want to categorize everything then things that are designed it's a long list right the windows uh, the doors and everything else the speaker cabinets the cup the telephone mobile everything that i talked about the calculator right everything is things that are designed, the things that are in the office and the user has designed or I have designed myself. Um, it's not a long list, but it is very, very obvious, right? 
the way I have kept my desk, the position of my laptop, the position of my monitor, I've designed it, right? I own the design. I might not think about myself if I'm not a designer that, oh, I design user experience, but I've also designed this. This is a physical um, example of how I've designed my desk, right? The way I've, and things that are definitely not designed, although you might, uh, you can't see them. Um, uh, you might have thought about things through um, uh, that you might have seen through the window, example, the sky, the bird, opposite building, et cetera, et cetera, right? They might not be designed because, again, you would say that there is no human intervention in designing those, and probably it was created by nature or by God or whatever, right? But essentially, there are these categories of things, and there is a design element to everything, the way everything has been created, right? So if you if you think about all of these, there are two types of designs essentially. There are more, and uh, I'm sure uh, I know that some of uh, the people on this call have come from design schools, right? They've they've learned a lot about it. But just for the benefit of people who have learned by themselves, there are primarily two different types of designs. There are more, like I said, but just two is what I'm covering. The first one is a designer design, right? So if you think uh, if you ask uh, most people right, uh, to think about design, uh, they would probably mention something like, a, uh, like a, I don't know how many of you guys know, but there is a company called Dyson that creates vacuum cleaners and uh, those hair dryers, et cetera. Right? And they look completely different than any other product in the market. So they, they design those vacuum cleaners and those hair dryers or blowers, whatever you call it. Um, which nobody else does. So immediately you would think about those things. Uh, something that looks a little bit different from the other things in the same category. Uh, and that probably claims to uh, outperform them as well, right? Um, most of us think of the designs that uh, we've seen from companies like Apple right uh, an iphone or an ipad and and the things that they've done in the past with those um, mac machines and all of those those right is something else that people associate when we talk about design uh, something that looks good and performs differently and the different is the key word here so designer design is actually different in its category but it's not the only object that we uh, that uh, that can have the design catch in it, right? Uh, uh, a gleaming new building uh, that might uh, that might be introduced as a designed uh, concept, right? So we see lots of um, uh, buildings here. So the the left bottom that you see, uh, it is called uh, the Cloud Gate. It's a it's a it's a monument in Chicago. Uh, it's also called the Beam. Uh, some of you might know about it. It's designed by a British Indian designer called Anish Kapoor. Um, it's a very, very popular thing uh, in the US uh, and also in, in the world. Um, and people, when we talk about the designer design, they think about this, right? There is no meaning to this if we see it from, uh, from a layman's perspective, but there is a deep meaning to this, right? Uh, but then, of course, there are other things like, for example, fashion, uh, right? Um, so uh, the collection that has been designed by Louis Vuitton, that could be a designer design, right? It looks different. It performs differently from any other brand in the same category. And that's why it is treated as designer design. Right? Now, there is another design, which is called as quite a silent design, which is what we are very interested in in these five days. A designer design sometimes put people off engaging with that design because of its exclusivity, because of its cost, because they are um, expensive, because they're designed for a niche market for specific audiences. Uh, and it sometimes seems as if the things that have been uh, given to us by the designers rather than being something which we, part we, we participate in, right? So how do I use a Louis Vuitton bag, uh, the bag costs more than the money that I can keep in the bag, right? Um, so essentially, uh, 
not many people would relate to it. Yet there is another side to the design, which we call as coit design. Uh, by this, I mean the kind of design that you and I might uh, do in a uh, do to our person uh, do in our personal space, or the things that are designed but go unnoticed. These are things that quietly improve the lives without realizing until we stop and think about them. And that's exactly what we're talking about as human-centered design. So the person who's using it, uh, whether it be a service or a product or anything that we design, if they're noticing the design and if they feel that it has been designed for a specific purpose, then it then it's then there is a room for improvement for that, right? But then if they're using it as it's the way of working and it's the way of doing that or performing that particular action, then it is something that is that go that goes very, very silently or quietly into the user's behavior. And that's how we probably change human behavior because, because the way it works, right? So one example uh, of this could be the way uh the roads or the roundabouts have been designed right uh where an improved junction or a roundabout can significantly ease the congestion and with it uh reduce the stress of the drivers uh, another is something that we simply uh, uh another is something that uh as simple as new bench or 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 let's say a, a seating area in a park which which gives you a fabulous view right uh, um, let's say on a on a beach right uh, or at a park those are things that you probably that probably go unnoticed but there is a lot of thought process that that has gone behind it so let's talk about this particular image that i have on my presentation here so quiet design is much more prevalent than designer design and impacts almost every aspect of our lives. That's how, uh, that's not to say that quiet design isn't designed by the professionals. It is probably designed by um, a lot more people that we can think about and most of the time, but uh, sometimes it is referred to as, uh, not referred explicitly as design, like I, like I gave you an example sometime back. Uh, with we might uh, better describe quiet design uh, or silent design as being the product of design thinking. A good example is uh, by somebody called as Frank Blackmore, who had an idea about traffic roundabouts and how the signals would work. He primarily designed it for uh, the UK, but his design and the thought process behind it and the iterations that he did during that design affected the whole world and yet it is little known nobody knows about this guy and how he created this whole roundabout but if you think about it he has actually designed the way people should behave when they're on the road now if you think about design and uh, i've always had this uh, debate with a lot of people that we feel uh, in most of the organization, not just ours, but probably everywhere you would feel that, or you would hear that a designer is responsible for the design. And uh, I always, I've always uh, opposed that idea. If design is something that is able to, that is able to improve our lives and shape our behavior, uh, it is self evidently it self evidently originates from and involves people in contrast to an activity like an art where there is one person who's designing it and it is his idea and uh, he wants to convey uh, an idea it doesn't involve people it is just him uh, like uh, so if you're looking at a painting the painter has designed something and he has created an art and he's basically done with it right uh, it doesn't change anything in the in the world, right? Uh, design usually involves a number of people uh, and several different roles. Design then is something that is inherit inherently social, and uh, to put it another way, something that creates social and cultural value. 
of course there uh, this value can come from a lot of different forms ease effectiveness of use economic value aesthetic value or uh, functional uh, value uh, meaningfulness and all of these and more contribute to the way in which design creates a value let's think about a number of people that might be involved in design first of all uh, we have the designer themselves right all of you guys uh for a moment uh we can assume that they are in the fulcrum of the design process but perhaps that is more than one designer if product is complicated let's say an a car or a television or a piece of software uh then there will be a lot of designers working together even for seemingly simple products there will be often more than one person who we would call as or we would tag as designer so the designer or the team of designers is usually working on behalf of someone and that someone a person we normally call as client or the sponsor so this client or the sponsor person who has the unfulfilled need to build something uh that we mentioned earlier they have a problem that needs to be solved and usually uh prepared to and usually is prepared to pay um in whatever ways right to get that solved the solution to that problem will often involve two further groups of people uh manufacturers uh, who will make the product and the users who will use and consume the product together these four groups um these four groups uh, form the core of the people involved in the design so if you look at if you look at it the client or the sponsor the designer has designed it the consumer is using it and the maker who's making it right all of these are people who have designed the product because the feedback that comes from the consumer the uh, the brief that comes from a client or in our case it could be a project manager or a business analyst or, or a product owner or a sponsor whoever we work with right all of these guys plus the engineers to test the feasibility plus the architects who would say what is possible what's not possible uh, plus the technology guy or the human resource guy or the software that we use because of our it teams right pretty much everyone is involved in taking decisions and somewhere designing this whole piece together right note that the design is at the center and the di uh, of the dialogue which di with different stakeholders so essentially it's it's more like communication uh, channels but essentially the designer is sitting in between now when i say designer it is not somebody who has a title designer it is everyone who's involved in coming up with an idea to solve a problem everyone is a designer here right now the role that these types of people play like a designer or a client or a user can often overlap and especially the designs uh, uh, for the design students it would be the same person right for somebody um, like us if we're designing for something to improve within learning rate it would be we will be playing all all the roles right generally however these will be different people and different groups of people and essentially that's where the social concept comes in because you're trying to connect as many people as possible with what we are designing right so in a gist of whatever we've learned so far design is all around us it satisfies a specific need it creates a value or it has to create a value rather uh, it changes behavior the way we saw in that roundabout thing and it always involves people now these are i think five important things when you when you when somebody asks what what do you do right these are the five things that we do um right uh, essentially to define what design is okay. so if you look up in the uh, the word design in a dictionary you will find that it is like as let's like said initially it's verb as well as noun as a verb it means to plan to draw to create or to uh, intend to create whatever right as a noun it refers to a drawing an object a plan 
in the scheme. So creation as well as the output is what is defined in the dictionary as design. Now let's move forward and talk about thinking. So what exactly would be thinking, right? So I'm going to talk about um, what exactly we mean by design thinking itself, right? Um, so let's spend a little time talking about the history of design thinking and how it came to be what it is and how it is different from some of the other tools and methods and the frameworks uh, that we use today. So let's take a little bit deeper into really looking at the high level of what design thinking is popularized by the Institute of Design at Sanford, which is popularly known as D-School and widely used to tackle problems from business to, uh, to manufacturing to education. Design thinking is a creative problem solving process that focuses on understanding the needs of the user, rapidly testing, iterating, validating, and then bringing about the inner creative genius within the teams. If you Google uh, and look for design thinking and go into the images section, these are some of the images that you would see at the top results, right? This is a really great way for us to get an overview of what design thinking is because you realize and you see all these diagrams that look very much the same. And at the core of them is the same concept, which is essentially what we're calling as design thinking framework. A way of thinking about solving problems that are shifting our view from creating products for business reasons and shifting it to thinking about solving real users' needs and understanding what people's real problems are and, and then finding solutions for those rather than saying, this is what needs to be designed, go ahead and design it, right? If you do it like that, which I think most of us have been doing so far, it is not design thinking. It is just probably direction and uh, a design on top of it, right? So if you look at one of these diagrams and I've just, used the same images that you saw on the previous slide. They all look very similar. Design thinking process often has these five steps. Ours has six, but I'll come to that. Um, actually seven, but uh, it starts with empathizing with people, uh, which we call as users, understanding their problems, defining the problem more concretely, ideating uh, to come up with multiple solutions that might work for them. We don't know, but we would create multiple solutions, creating some quick prototypes out of those or possible solutions, and then testing them again with the same real people. Uh, again, real is important here. Uh, so we've got this general process that's that's about doing these five or six steps, whatever, uh, or phases, and that's what we call as design thinking. right? But at the core of this thing is to see that Within each of these five steps, there is a ton of flexibility and a ton of different tools um, or different methods uh, or templates that you can use to solve these problems or satisfy the need of a one particular phase or the step. Right? Um, it doesn't give you a real concrete step-by-step -step process how to empathize with the user. It depends on the product, it depends on the problem, it depends on the situations. And based on that, you apply different tools to try and meet the needs of that particular step. So every time, everything that we do, we might not get an opportunity to talk to the real users or uh, do an interview with them, right? And try and record what they're saying and basically design it, right? But then there are tools that could be used in order to satisfy the need of this particular phase, right? Um, there is a best practice, but there is also a way out to do things. So from a definition perspective, design thinking refers to a cognitive strategic and practical process by which design concepts like proposals of new products, building machines, et cetera, developed by designers, or design teams, it associate 
uh, it's associated with perceptions of innovation of products with uh, with the perception of innovation of products and services within the business and social context now social is important business is important because somebody is going to invest within the uh, in that idea and of course innovation is where you would want to create something new and not copy something that's already existing uh, that's about how we how we design products and services in a way of thinking that's based on user needs and really, really strongly related to human-centered design. Um, so what's interesting here is are the methods and the problem uh, for problem framing, solving really difficult, tricky problems and empathizing with users. Uh, and the whole concept of this divergent and convergent thinking, which is about really opening up to lots of different options and then narrowing it down and focusing on the ones that everyone feels would work. Something that you will see um, as part of design sprints, and I intend to cover some bit of design sprints in this five days as well. Now, this Got whole one question. Mm -hmm. one question for the empathy. Should I should I ask? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So uh, let's example a particular domain we don't like it or a particular things a domain is new for us, and we research for the uh, for the user persona. I mean we have actually connected with the people. We understand their problems, everything. Okay, and we have the sympathy, but how we can create the empathy to understand like uh, what the shoes they are wearing? I don't think it, it depends on the domain. And as a designer, you don't really always understand the domain and you don't have to. Uh, because with that whole process of understanding the situations, and I would I would cover that when I say empathy uh, in, in the coming uh, days, how exactly do you observe and understand the whole idea behind trying to solve that problem? Because please understand that designers cannot be SMEs all the time. And we won't be because we cannot know every aspect of design. It's an add-on thing. Some people do have it, but not all designers would have it. But understanding and keeping all of that, what you have learned in empathy with the stakeholders as well as the users would somewhere define if you have really empathized with the users or not. And it doesn't really mean that you only have to talk to the end user. It also means that you talk to the stakeholders who are involved in this whole process with you. That's why I said it is social, right? In this case, and if, we, if I want to give an example, when we are talking about solving a problem, let's say for K-12 education, there are people who understand K-12 education and they become your stakeholder in this whole process. It is not between a customer who says that I want to build a registration form, you go ahead and design it or build it, right? You take ideas from what exists in the market, what you have done it in the past and what has worked, what hasn't worked and all of that. But if you have to really get into the, the details of something very, very specific, not really registration, it's a bad example, but for something which needs a bigger picture to be understood, then the stakeholders become your point of contact for that empathy phase. They tell you what the domain is and why, why we are doing certain things in certain ways, right? There could be technology advancements in one domain, but not in the other. For example, education is not one of those fields or domains which is technologically advanced than anything else that you would see. Probably uh, um, medicine or uh, things like banking or uh, insurance are much, much ahead in this whole thing, right? So essentially, knowing domain is not really something that is a must have, but essentially it's good to have. But if you keep those stakeholders along with you in the design process, then you are, then you don't have a problem with it, right? But if you don't keep those stakeholders and you try and design it from your perspective and say that this is something that I design, then it's, it becomes a design that you're designing for yourself rather than the user, okay. or rather than solving the problem. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at some of these organizations who have really popularized this whole thing, idea comes to um, comes to our mind. 
uh, it's a big design consulting company uh, that was founded by somebody called as David Kelly, who popularized the term design thinking in 1991. Although the previous graphic that we saw might look very, very linear, uh, it, is a, it is a practice very, very clinical, iterative, and messy. Uh, and it's OK. Uh, because the reason uh, is that it's non-linear, linear. Um, because throughout the process, we are constantly crafting clarity by testing assumptions and squeezing out the risk, um, and sometimes an overturn assumption will require to us to revisit the previous steps, like empathy, and to learn more. And uh, or a misscoped challenge, which hasn't been the right challenge, we might go back and scope it all over again because we want to narrow down to the real problem that we want to solve rather than what has been defined as the problem that we want to solve. So it it also has a you also get a leeway to go back and do that because that's what uh, we would want to do, right? In order to solve the real problem. So from from this whole concept perspective, it's not really a cookbook or it's not really a recipe book, um, in other words, where it tells you you need to take one spoon of this and 20 ml of water and uh, heat the oil at 120 degrees and then put everything and then mix it, wait for two seconds or put two whistles in a pressure cooker and it will be ready. It's not like that. and uh, there is no notion there is there's a notion about uh, design thinking that it's a it actually is all about what i just said whether the answers fall out at the end or not the truth is it is messier than it's basically saying uh, here that design thinking is a linear path uh, it's a big mass of looping back and forth uh, into different places in different processes uh, they're talking about five-step process or six-step process, but it's always going back and forth. So they're only uh, so they're really acknowledging that design thinking is not a clear step-by-step -step process, and you can that you can follow. It's a big mess of tools and mindsets and methods that you can learn and then adapt and use. And basically, it is all about practice. And that's what it says that it is all about doing rather than following a process. Right? I mean, of course, uh, it's it's always said that you trust the process because it would eventually lead you to uh, the outcome that you desire. But it is also about practicing as much as possible. The origins, however, or the history of design thinking comes back from 1960s. So this got popularized in 91 by David Kelly, but essentially it comes from 1960s. And, have, and it has got its foundations from psychology, computer science, anthropology, ethnography, computer and human computer action, interaction, right? Interaction design, a lot of industrial design. And uh, it was really thorough research and experts in all of these fields that helped us create what we call today as design thinking. The term, like I said, uh, was then popularized by David Kelly. But another important person that we should all be talking about here is Don Norman, because a lot of his ideas uh, in the book that he is, and I'm sure you must have read at least one book that Don Norman has written, uh, the most popular <laughs> design for everyday things. And a lot of concepts that he talks about in that book, which was written long back, are also something that has molded what we today call as human-centered design or design thinking. It talks about the fundamentals of design while the term design thinking isn't used in that book, but the fun fundamentals of the whole framework of design thinking, human-centered design about understanding the user needs, designing things, innovating to solve those problems, watching, observing, observing users, understanding, empathizing, all of that is touched upon in that book. 
So Don Norman, of course, deserves a special mention because he, he didn't really create it, but he did really define what it is going to be called as design thinking in the future. So if we try and understand what our process is, which we are going to cover in the next few days, this is what it looks like. You would see the difference here. Um, we have broken the empathize phase into two, understanding and observe, because that's probably the only way where it would work for a company like ours and the setup like ours, or the domain like ours, right? And we've also got a new thing here at the right, which you won't see in some of those graphics that I showed you earlier. It's called as a reflect because some of the pieces that we design for ourselves need a continuous reflection in terms of where we stand today and how it could be improved and is it still working and what we designed probably two years back, is it still something that is relevant today, right? So that's a step that we added as part of our design council. Of course, you would see the, uh, the whole thing around divergent and convergent thinking, which is essentially coming up with ideas and then, of course, uh, implementing them or creating them, right? But uh, you would see some of those pieces in the tools that we're going to talk about in the next few days, as well as um, a quick way of running some of the design sprints also touch upon some of these aspects. So what's the first thing that I think we should keep in mind, not just for this session, but also for any time we try and implement design thinking. As human beings, we have never dealt with, as human beings who have never dealt with design thinking, right? Often ask the simple analogies uh, to help envision it, it better, right? So we have had good experiences with take, talking to these people on an imaginary road trip to their childhood. So especially if you are, say, a five year or six year old, all children have something common. They ask questions. And we're going to learn about some of these tools that would help us define how do we ask questions. Uh, there are lots of techniques. Uh, there are uh, five whys and how, and then there are uh, lots of other things that we're going to cover in the coming few days. Uh, but these questions are in order are asked in order to learn and understand situations. Nor do children know any zero error culture. Uh, and that's also something that we need to add into the way we work, that errors should be welcomed rather than you don't want to really make a mistake. Of course, it doesn't have to be intentional. Uh, nobody wants to fail in what they design, but you have to take it positively. And that's what design thinking teaches. Um, so for, for us, doing learning and trying again stands in the forefront. And this is how children learn to walk, draw, and so on, right? Think about a child who's trying to learn to walk. If he's ashamed of not able to walk properly uh, or stand, and then he falls, he would never walk if he's ashamed of doing that. So over the years, many of us have forgotten the ability to explore this type of experimental learning and our education in schools and universities have taken care of the rest so we do not question and investigate the facts and circumstances in a big way. With the beginner's mind, which is going to be the most essential thing that we're going to uh, continuously touch upon, I would really want you to uh, want to encourage uh, all of you to ask questions as though we don't we didn't have the slightest idea of the un of the answers like an alien who's come out of the outer space, who sets his foot on Earth and the first time, uh, for the first time and asks himself, why are we throwing plastic everywhere in our cities? And why, why are we throwing junk into our rivers, which turn into oceans? 
and work during the day and sleep at night and so on and so forth, right? These questions would lead into things that we overlook most of the time and essentially try and somewhere overcome the biases that we are also going to talk about uh, in the, the future uh, slides. So if your mindset is unprejudiced, it is open to everything uh, and a beginner's mind is really open for possibilities. But an expert's mind, there is only a few that 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 would be available, right? A beginner's mind or the attitude is free of prejudices about how something works. Uh, it's free of expectations about what will happen. It's filled with curiosity, understand things more deeply, open to the world of possibilities, and try and be part of that journey. And what is possible and what is not really rather than predicting it uh, it is always about being participating in that whole journey and fail early and often and learn quickly there is a very famous character in a saying i'm sure all of you guys would have seen this but uh, uh this says you know nothing john snow and essentially that is what we need to keep as an attitude when i say nothing it doesn't mean that you don't you know nothing but when you're trying to design something and understand humans and understand their behaviors and understand what they're going through at that point in time you know nothing all you're doing is asking questions again and again and using the techniques that we're going to talk about so rather than from i know we slowly move towards i wonder and ask questions so how we behave in order to apply design thinking successfully, um, change in behavior and attitude towards things is basically what we would want to cover. So when practicing design thinking, it is very much uh, like learning how to ride a bike. And I talked about this whole practice thing and uh, you can read about how to ride a bike. You can watch a video on YouTube. But until you sit on a bike, fall, get back up again, you won't develop the muscle memory to use it. And design thinking is all about muscle memory. Likewise, uh, until we practice the methods, we won't experience the difference between just following the script and embodying the hard to observe yet critical mindsets required for successfully developing a practice of design thinking. Here are the mindsets uh, that uh, we habitually practice, and they will be referenced extensively throughout the process that we're going to go through. And we'll exp explicitly call it out as well. And uh, in the coming sessions, uh, I think I would want to hear from you guys what mindset are we covering when we are trying to talk about some of those tools. So these mindsets are not mutually exclusive. They are a lot more and they overlap, but essentially these are the ones that have worked, at least in my experience, and that's what I want that I'm covering today. Focusing on people, we focus on human beings and build empathy and, uh, and are mindful when exploring his or her need. People with their need, possibilities, experience, and knowledge using the beginner's mind attitude uh, we're starting at a point for all considerations people know pleasure which is what we call as gains and their frustrations which we call as pains have tasks to be fulfilled and idea about focusing on people is to understand all of these things as human beings we are curious we ask questions but during the design process, we somewhere miss out on those. So asking questions continuously change the perspective in order to look at the things from various sides or various angles, which essentially also comes in by, by being social in the way we design it. So the stakeholders that we talked about come in and they help us with some of these awarenesses that we create about problems that we're trying to solve as well as the solutions and how they would behave when it is designed. In design thinking, it is crucial and it uh, of crucial, crucial importance
to understand what we work on and what greater vision ought to be pursued. Uh, in order to find solution, the team must have internalized the problem. All of us should be on the same page in terms of what exactly are we trying to solve and what have we understood uh, as a team rather than as an individual. Involving interdisciplinary teams where you're collaborating with different teams and different people who come with different experiences and different domains and different cultures, holistic consideration of problem statement uh, would be there. So the team members from various skills, specialists, specialities of knowledge help the creative process and with the reflection upon ideas. Experimenting and iterating continuously with prototypes uh, and the solutions being visual about it uh, really helps us solve the problem uh, in the context of a user. Trying to be mindful of the process. I talked about the iterations that you would go back and forth. That's fine, but you would probably be spending more time than what you should be in trying to do back and forth uh, between the steps. So being mindful about the process and where you are at and where you want to be and how much time you've spent is really, really critical so that you also complete the task rather than trying to create something which is perfect and there is nothing perfect. So you would continuously iterate and improve upon it. But design thinking also tells you that you be mindful of the whole process itself and where you are at in that. Visually, show and tell is really, really critical in this whole thing where rather than talking about ideas, we show our ideas. And of course, bias towards action is really important where design thinking is, uh, is not just based upon the lengthy considerations by somebody who sits alone behind the closed doors. Instead, it lives from doing, essentially involving people and trying and trying trying to do things rather than just talking about it. Um, and of course, accepting the complexity is also very important where you, you somewhere accept uncertainty and the fact that complex problems demand complex solutions, these mindsets and the success factors are crucial because each make us capable of acting and help pose the right questions. It is a small changes uh, with the mindsets that we just talked about that enables us to pose questions in different ways and look at problems from different points of views. So again, it's a non-linear way of tackling design problems. It is not linear and it is based on solution rather than problem. Um, again, like I said, it is all about practicing. So it's a hands-on method, um, immersive where you need to get involved and involve a lot of other people in it, user-centered and at the core, these people sit and these are our users. Uh, it revolves around what works best for the people that we're designing for and also understanding their pain points and motivations and what would eventually work for them. Um, in the next session tomorrow, we would start talking about empathy and how it helps and how it evolves from our understanding of the problem to the understanding of the users. And this is the last slide probably where like I said, design thinking is all about doing um, rather than um, doing it in parts. It is all about practicing and trying to understand and inherit some of those mindsets into our daily processes in the way we think, we talk, and we execute some of those things that we do day in and day out. It's all about doing it and practicing it so that it becomes our muscle memory rather than following a process. All right. I think we have some 15 minutes left. Um, are there any questions, suggestions for tomorrow that you guys want uh, to include? Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions as well. I have a little different question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. 
No, no, I just wanted to uh, check with Gaurav. Is there any preparation you want the team to do uh, before coming for tomorrow's session? Mm, no. No, I don't think so. So. Yeah, Karuna. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Iman. So, uh, Gaurav, it's in the last few slides. One of the slides you mentioned that about when you're showing the design thinking, uh, that process okay in that you have uh, you have shown that the empathy is divided between two uh one is observation and the i forgot whatever what was the label of that it's a kind of a research and you also mentioned that this this kind of things works for our company such like that so why do you say like that so i mean again uh, there are these concepts where we say that we have to understand the users and understand their behaviors and observe them, interview them and all of that. But essentially understanding becomes a very, very crucial phase in all of that, which a lot of times is missed where we don't really understand what the problem is because everyone is not on the same page. And that's why it has been called out separately that understand and observe needs to be two different things within empathize phase. So that you cre create a clear distinction in terms of are you on the same page and then what are you observing rather than saying i want to really go and empathize with the user it is also empathizing with the stakeholder it is also empathizing with the rest of the team and understanding where they are at in this whole process and are they all on the same page that's why it has been called out separately. okay thanks yeah thanks All right, I guess there are no more questions. Uh, so uh, there is something that I want to say, uh, Gaurav. Uh, thanks for this session, and this is really great. I know I have attended previously two design thinking uh, workshops in the past, but what I have seen there was that you know it was more about tool sets. Uh, what I appreciate in the session, the way you conducted, is the whole concept and uh, you know uh, the the background uh, behind design thinking and uh, the overall uh, aspect of design thinking and not just about the tool set, right? So that is very great because uh, as designers, what our mindsets should be and, you know, as a holistically, how it is more a team effort and there is so much of um, uh, the process in itself, how much it demands and all of this, this aspect is very, very important to understand. And thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so uh, in the uh, in your sessions, uh, okay, there is one thing that uh, personally I am also looking uh, at is uh, there is always a, a dilemma, right? As designers, that how much for each process, right? So anything as a challenge that you have, big, small, and how do you define a big see, something which is really a basic one where you need to really just have a quick solution versus a problem when it is stated how big that problem is how complex that problem is just identification of a, of a problem to be able to apply certain tool sets or to apply a design thinking process to it that identification also is a very important aspect so in your uh, sessions uh, you know if uh, you can talk about uh, that aspect also it will be great i'll be looking forward to that yeah in fact there is there are tools that we use to bring everyone on the same page to define what the problem is what the challenge is and and of course challenging the challenge itself so that we really make sure that we are working on the same thing collectively as a team and then of course validating it before you actually start designing and getting into the rest of the things it is also about defining what you are really trying to solve which is a key piece that is missed out a lot of times so we'll be talking about some of the tools so that we can bring everyone together and define a design challenge and then start working on it rather than saying that we want to do this one person giving a direction and a designer jumping onto it directly so yeah. we'll talk about that as well okay so that aspect of problem identification right i'm talking of one step before that there is where where you see an ambiguity and when you want to go into a process of design thinking while where we uh, consider that okay this is more of a, a problem uh, it is more of you know 
a team work that has to really solve a problem. Uh, am I able to uh, explain what I'm trying to say? I'm just saying that what is a problem which is ambiguous versus what is a more straightforward structure opposed to a solution. So that kind of an discussion. I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. And we can we can talk about it tomorrow. Uh, I think I would cover it in what I have planned. But if I don't, then we can spend some time and brainstorm on it as well. Great. Thank you. All right, cool. Uh, thanks everyone for attending, getting up early. Um, we would meet again same time tomorrow and uh, cover the empathy aspect. And as much as we can possibly cover, we'll try and do that and try and look at some of the tools as well while we're talking about the concepts and why they have been designed in certain way as well. All right. Um, thanks again. Uh, we'll meet you tomorrow. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, Garo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.